Well, hello folks and welcome to the Dieter Melhorn Fishing Podcast. I hope you're having a good day, whatever day it is that you happen to be listening to the show or watching it on YouTube. Uh, as many of you know, we have an audio version and a YouTube version, so you can check them both out. Uh, you want links to them, go to my website, DieterMelhornFishing.com. Also links to my guide business there. I'm a charter captain here in the Carolinas, so you can check that out. Hey, we got a guest on today that I've had on before, Christian Moore. He's a charter captain uh, down on the James River, home of some of the biggest catfish in the country. And if you ever need a charter captain to take you out fishing the James River, you need to check him out and book him. I've sent several people. People down there, they love fishing with him. He's a great guy. He's as nice in person as he appears in this video podcast. I'll put you a link in the description uh, to his um, charter business down there. So uh, I got up with him. I was up in Virginia uh, again, uh, part of my trip doing some striper fishing up there, and uh, decided to get up with him. He's working on some stuff. He's on a panel, basically that is addressing the blue cat issue in. Eastern Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, that whole area up through there. Uh, some of you may or may not know, most of the people up there don't want the blue cat around. Uh, you know, ironically, it's some of the biggest blue cat fish in the country are up there. So uh, part of the reason is some of the blame is it's ruining blue crab populations, other fish populations. We'll go into all that in the podcast. But the bottom line is they don't want them. And uh, if it, they could wave, uh, biologists, if you ask them, could wave a magic wand, they'd have them all disappear. Uh, that can't happen. So they're having to deal with it. And that's what we're going to talk about with Christian. It's just what's going on there. Uh, and, you know, just a little uh, a little picture here for people that may not know. Blue catfish are not native everywhere. Where I fish, the fish that I fish for, they're not native here. They are basically in the Mississippi River drainages. Anything east of the Appalachian Mountains is, uh, they're, they're not native here. So they're not native anywhere up through the area that we're going to talk about with Christian. So it's a, it's an interesting problem. Uh, it's an interesting way they're approaching it. And uh, hopefully they uh, come up with a solution, probably more of a compromise than anything, that will uh, benefit the angler and the saltwater fishermen that make their living there. So off to our podcast with Christian Moore. Give me the background on how blue catfish got here that's easy enough yeah. the virginia wildlife put them in here in the 70s and what was the reason for that yeah. they wa they wanted to generate a species for recreational angles of many different skill levels to fish for you know because it's easy to catch the little ones right you know you can put just about anything on a hook and go catch the small fish as well, you know, the trophy size class fish that are very sought after that we like to catch, it's, a, it's very challenging to catch those fish. Yeah. How long was it before, well, how long was it before the bigger fish started showing up? So the bigger fish probably started to show up early 90s, late 80s, somewhere now I would imagine they started catching citation class fish. And then uh, I think what they're, what I've been told is the peak of it was around 2000 to 2010 and then it's slowly been on the decline in terms of trophy class fish why do you think that is so i can tell you exactly why that is or what virginia wildlife is telling me and it and it kind of makes sense so there's such a large biomass currently and this is not just on the james river uh it's all the rivers the rappahannock the mattapanai the york the pamunkey even the potomac uh the class of fish that make up the majority of the biomass, you know, that two to three, four, five, six pound fish, there's an abundant amount of those fish. And they are in such a high competition to feed. And what that scenario generates is it's reducing their growth rate. So in order for these monster fish that we love to catch, or for them to get big enough, they have to get to that next stage in their growth rate to where they can eat the full-size gizzard shad and eat the full-size crappie or whatever it is that they're feeding on to really start elevating their growth rate. And what my biologist has told me is here recently within the last 10 to 15 years, doing their population studies, their catfish's growth rates have significantly declined. And that is what's contributing. 
like don't get me wrong there's still plenty of big fish in the james river it is one of the destinations anywhere in the country yeah it's yeah. it's a killer fishery but coming from someone who's been on it three or four times a week for the past five years it's getting a little harder and harder each year because you know every time i hit the water i'm looking for a 60 plus pound fish that's kind of my metric for whether i have a good day or not not every day does that does that happen but probably i would say 70 percent of trips we at least get a you know mid 50s to a 60 plus pound fish yeah that's interesting it's kind of the old theory of, of uh if a man has a pizza all to himself he'll eat it and get fat mm -hmm. if he's got to split it with six other people he's Probably gonna That's be it, tough man. to lose. There's it, there's a lot of there's a lot of kids at the dinner table right now on these yeah. rivers. Yeah. So I guess that speeds us up to where we are now. Mm -hmm. And what when did these fish come on the radar of the fish and wildlife people up here to where, hey, this is the problem or in terms of like what you're you're asking from the invasive standpoint? Yep. Invasive, non-native, I think is how they characterize it. So I think, Dieter, I think the the brunt of all this really started not in Virginia so much as it did in Maryland. Because, yeah. you know, obviously they're seriously invasive to the Maryland waters and over on the eastern shore because they were put in the Virginia rivers. They were not supposed to travel across the bay and get into those areas. And I think, you know, the ICW, the board that I sit on, one of the things you hear the most is the their uh, threat to the blue crab population. And if anybody knows anything about Maryland in the United States, that's like their, their thing, that's their cash cow. And I think that's really what's driven the uh, animosity towards the fish, the hatred you know, they're trying to make them out to be an evil creature, if you will. And I, I think that's where a lot of that comes from. But with that said, and uh, Virginia being the ones that put them in there, obviously they're, it's very high on their radar to monitor it and do studies on it. Yeah, and I heard one of the biologists, I think he was from Virginia, using those two terms, non-native and invasive. They're not necessarily the same, but they can be. Uh, I guess they would be non-native to Virginia because they were introduced, they'd be invasive to Maryland because they were never introduced up there and they moved up there. One of, one of the other charter captains brought that term up today, the word invasive. You know, we were, we were act, talking about action items for the next meeting and, and you know, what do you guys want to see moving forward? And he said, here's an idea. How about we kind of use a different word besides invasive? Because one, I mean, that's bad for business. You know what I mean? Uh, we love these fish. We love catching them. Uh, definitely don't want them to generate a bad reputation for potential clients that would want to come out and fish with us. They, they, there's, been, there's been research done. They've done harvesting fish, stomach samples, all that kind of stuff. What was kind of, give us a summary conclusion of what they found from that. So one of the coolest things that I actually learned it today in, in terms of the fish's ability to sustain in an ecosystem that has salt in it. And th and that, what they were saying, and this is more for the uh, the dominant, the larger fish, and when I say that, these, these they classify a larger fish as a fish over 15 pounds. I was told, I think the number was any salt water that was over, I think it was like 15 or 16 parts per million, the fish could sustain life in it and survive for up to 72 hours. So, and what the biologist has explained to me, when we have a lot of rain, like right now, what that does is that broadcasts a stream of fresh water running out into the Chesapeake. And the fish have followed that, and uh, that's kind of, where they've gained the ability to spread throughout the bay. And I guess a lot of fresh water also pushes further down the bay mm -hmm. when you have something like a rain event like we've just had, yep. and that may drag them down there to feed or whatever, and it basically makes them comfortable in that whole area. Something else they uh, told us about that Virginia Wildlife is doing is they are currently doing a telemetry study where they have tagged a lot of fish 
a lot of them are trophy class fish and they're monitoring and tra tracking their migratory patterns. So I'm chomping at the bit to get that data. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see just how far they are going, how many you know, resident fish you have that hang out in a certain area and how many of them go up to. One thing they touched on today, they did say uh, a lot of the creek fish are more prone to stay within the creek year round. They said it was funny how the, the cohorts, if you will, of different class fish, some would uh, have extremely high migratory behavior, and then a lot of them would stay in the, if they were in a tributary off of the main rivers, they would kind of stay in there pretty much all year. From what I've seen, I, I've seen some taped interviews with some biologists and fisheries people, not just the people from Fish and Wildlife, but some other independent university professors, that kind of stuff, yep. is that the blue cat plays a part, but it's not it's not the sole culprit for the demise of the blue crab. No, they're absolutely not. You know, uh, a red drum, that's a, a red drum is a big, uh, that's a big part of their food source. Um, I don't know if the rockfish eat them, you know, the striped bass, they, they may eat them. Um, I don't know if sharks, they could potentially eat them out there. down where we are, they eat them a lot. What I, what I was hearing was there was a lot of tie to some of the grasses that grow that the blue crabs feed on stuff that's in the grasses. Grass growth is on a decline. Yep. And a lot of that's attributed to drought conditions, too much water, runoff from industry, yep. fertilizer development, all that kind of stuff. I mean, me being an optimist, if you will, I always try to give different groups and organizations the benefit of the doubt. Where I'm at with it, I want to see the science prove it. You know, when they're doing diet studies and stuff on fish, obviously, yes, they have discovered that they eat the, the crabs. But where I'm at are the, you know, the commercial crabbing guys, are they not meeting their quotas? I, I believe they are. I haven't, you would see an uproar in that community if they weren't meeting their quotas. Now, I don't remember the exact number, but there's a line that Virginia and or Maryland want to see from a population study for the blue crab. And it's went up and down and they kind of showed a chart and it was at its lowest when the, the blue catfish kind of peaked in that 2000 to 2010 range. And it's been going up and down, dancing around that line that's not acceptable where they need to do something, but it's it's still above that line yeah. for what I'm understanding. Yeah, and from what I've seen in some of the videos that some of, I've seen some biologists film with the shocking programs, and I think you had said you taped some stuff too. Mm -hmm. yeah. There, it's not just four or five blue cats floating to the top. We're talking eater size, two, three, four pound fish. Mm -hmm. They are literally looked like hundreds coming to the top. I think uh, there were multi multiple different organizations at this meeting today, but I think it was uh, a lady from VMRC, Vir Virginia Marine Commission. Uh, I think they estimated the catfish population in the James River to be at uh, 75 million. Wow, that's the first time I've heard anybody actually ever put a number on how many fish are in a place. They based it off of a study, and it was something like 580 fish per hectare of water. I don't know what unit of measure that is, but, and then they took the surface volume of the actual river. And, you know, some areas are going to have more fish than not. That's just the average. But, yeah, that's what it, I was kind of shocked, too. I mean, that's, that's a lot of catfish. And I'm no mathematician, but... I don't think you could, if there are that many, if there's half that many, you couldn't kill them all. There's no way. No, and they know that. Like, a lot of these organizations, they, they, you know, they've talked to commercial fishermen. They have a, you know, it's a, a realization in their mind that they can't eradicate them. It's, it's, it's not fe feasibly possible. They, they, you know, their, their reproduction rates, their growth rates, are, it's still a, a catfish. They're a very hardy fish. And some of the things I've seen, I've seen an interview with a commercial fisherman, and that was fishing for him. And he said he had stopped fishing for him because he can't sell them. It's hard to, there's not enough avenues to sell the fish to where they can go to market or go to restaurants or anything like That's that. That's right. They, they talked a little bit about that. And, you know, like we were talking earlier, 
a catfish just by design and its uh, body makeup, what was that number? 24% I think of the, the overall fish's body weight is a is an eatable fillet. And the rest, you know, and from a processing standpoint, these processors, that's a lot of overhead for very little yield. Yeah. And then so, having to deal with doing with whatever you're going to do with the fish. It seemed like, I mean, are there any possibilities there for animal food, dog food, cat food? Yep. yep. Fertilizer. Are, yep. Fertilizer. That's a, that's a place. Cause uh, obviously uh, the biggest part of the fish, it's largest mass is its head. And they were saying that the head portions of the body could be going towards fertilizers and things like that. So you would think reducing this 75 million fish, would mean more food for some of the mid-sized fish to turn into trophy fish so that right. it goes back. So, I mean, can fishermen do anything? Can we start keeping some of these eater fish? And does anybody want to do that? Are we almost responsible to a certain extent for part of the problem ourselves? They talk, they talk about that. That is a, a talking point in these meetings, uh, getting the recreational anglers more involved. Um, and if it's under 32 inches in the state of Virginia, you can keep as many as you want. So I, I feel like that's a, that's a very uh, good slot size, if you will. But the main, you know, why am I up in these rooms with all these people with college degrees and smart farts? I just want to make sure during the process of all this, someone is taken into consideration the trophy side that this uh, these rivers, you know, provide for us anglers. You know, I, I put a video together for my presentation today. I've got folks who come fish with me from Texas, from Kansas. I've had a guy come down from Canada. It's a special thing, and that, that's why I'm on the board, and I want them to understand that they may be a nuisance in certain areas of the Chesapeake Bay area, but, man, are they an awesome fish for our fishery and, and for, as anglers. And has anybody ever done any economic impact study into what blue catfish have on this area? I know it's salt water. Everybody saltwater fishes and loves that kind of stuff. But has there been any studies into just so what the as, impact is? As a whole, not, not just tidal rivers, but I think the number that I've heard from uh, Virginia DWR just the species alone for the state of Virginia brings in some somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 million a year in revenue mm -hmm. just for catfish and, it, and Virginia's got some some pretty good fishery yeah I mean it is home to the world record world record right you yeah know, and several, the largest fish ever caught in the catfish tournament you know I mean it's 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 it's, it's a it's a check get. more anybody who's big into this game and enjoys trophy catfishing the James River or Kerr Lake is definitely on their bucket list. Yeah. What do you see from the casual angler that you come in contact with? Do they have an opinion on it? Are they aware of it? Or is this kind of all dictated and driven by kind of two polar opposite sides? Um, you'll, you'll see some guys who are aware, for, aware of it, but generally those folks have been in the game a while. They've been fishing a while. Um, I would I would say you know, there's a lot of people who have been going back and forth with, uh, and this is catfish anglers, with uh, Virginia wildlife and commercial anglers. I hear, I've heard stories that, you know, catfish tournaments and stuff for years about catfish anglers getting into it with commercial guys and stuff like that. But then you'll have your, your novice anglers who are just getting into catfishing. And the catfishing market, as you know, in general, over the last 10 years has just exploded. And you've got a lot of newcomers that are getting into the sport, and I would say they probably don't know as much about it, or you know. And that's that's another reason I'm getting into this, trying to bring it to light to get more people more aware of what's going on. Yeah, I know the government wheels always turn slow, mm -hmm. but what has kind of been, I don't know, your just perception of all this? Where it will. What are they wanting to do? Do they even have a clue what they want to do? No, all this is still in the planning stages, Dieter. They're, uh, they're getting, I guess, the way I would explain it is they're getting all the stakeholders' opinions, where they're at with it, what their entities uh, are telling them, because you've got representatives from uh, you know, the state of Maryland, state of Virginia, 
the VMRC, the wildlife departments from both states, uh, NOAA, FDA. There's a, a lot of organizations at these meetings. And I think at this stage, they're just trying to get a metric to see what everyone's end goal is before they really start putting the screws to it and figure out what they want to do. Now, who's the rep? representative for the lowly cat fishermen out there i mean how many people are showing up is there an organization behind it or no i mean there today and when when we're referencing this term meeting it was uh an icw meeting it's a board that i sit on and icw stands for invasive catfish work group and today we had there was 46 people at this meeting and there were four people, two recreational anglers and two charter captains that guide full time, myself being one of them. What do you think the end goal, or not the end goal, but what do you think, the end, what is a good end solution is the, is the best question. What would you like to see happen if you could wave the magic wand that would serve all the stakeholders? That's a good question. So synergy, you know, I, I use that word all the time if they could come to, first of all, the science has to prove what the harvest needs to be. They need to do extensive population studies on all these rivers, figure out what the biomass is. Because if, just remember, if they want to commercial fish these rivers, they have to determine how much they can take out of it per year for it to be a sustainable resource for the state. I think that's very important. Um, I think it could be a cash cow for commercial anglers, uh, you know, along with recreational anglers and guys like myself. I do think there's potential for us all to get along, but it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of research to get those numbers because you're dealing with such a huge ecosystem that has a lot of variables. What are their options if there's not a commercial market for Because, I mean, commercial fishing is the solution if you've got a place to sell them, but like that one angler or, or, or commercial fisherman I saw, he got tired of fishing for them because he couldn't sell them. I think that aspect of it is at the forefront of a lot of these uh, groups who are wanting to really press the commercial side of things. Like you said, they got they got to start with you know the government and the FDA restrictions on them. They're gonna some of that stuff is gonna have to be lifted a little bit to bring processing houses closer to the Chesapeake Bay area. I don't know the exact number or, or where they at logistically, but I, I do remember. Uh, a lot of the commercial guys, that's one of their biggest uh, gripes, if you will. Even if they go out there and kill it every day and harvest a lot of fish, there's nowhere to take them. And if the, if the places that they are taking them, they're burning a lot of fuel to get there and it's, it's hurting their, uh, their overhead. Yeah, I, and that's another thing. I don't think people realize how big this fishery is. Right. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm down here today and I was all the way, well, I was on the southern end to the point, there probably weren't blue catfish there, but the drive basically up here is almost paralleling that entire, it is huge. I mean, it took me two hours to get up here from down there. How close was I to fish down there near the bridge? How far? They're there. They, are they really? They're there, oh yeah. Wow. I've, I've fished for these things, you know, I've went all the way down, way past Williamsburg and caught catfish. And remember, um, brackish water is anything over uh, or under, I forget what the, the terminology is or the number, but it's brackish all the way up into Richmond most of the time, depending on how much rain. Like right now, we've got all this rain that's coming down the river and it's pushed a lot of fresh water. So guess what? Mr. Catfish is gonna go on a little exploratory and, and go further out into the bay, but they can, they're all over. I mean, obviously they've crossed the bay and got over on the eastern shore. So where you're at, yeah, he was swimming around down there. That is amazing. That is absolutely amazing. So is uh, kind of in closing. Is there anything the casual angler can do to support this cause? Voice their opinion. Is there a group they can get on board with? You know, not as of yet. I I want it after I had the first meeting today and kind of see where everybody's mind is at, because. I didn't hear anything in the meeting today that kind of scared me like, oh my God, I need to rethink my career as a charter captain for catfish. If it does get to that point, you best believe there's going to be something that I start, uh, probably a petition, get signatures, start a group. 
Um, I do know that uh, Virginia Wildlife was very appreciative of me showing up today. Uh, put a little video together, uh, took uh, little snippets from multiple anglers, not only from Virginia, but people who travel here to fish and, you know, got their opinion on it. And Virginia Wildlife was super appreciative of that representation. So there will be something like that if they if they push that button yeah it sounds to me like they are being reasonable with all this it sounds like they i don't get the feeling there's any underlying like you know i, I think the biggest problem is it's not like they could just go out and it's not like it's a little you know county lake where they can go out and poison the whole lake and start over you can't do that there right so seven, 72 million catfish is that n number accurate who knows but what accurate number we were given is how much was harvested out of the James River last year in pounds. It was somewhere between 2.5 and 3 million pounds of catfish were taken from the James River last year. Now that's in pounds. If there's 75 million fish in there, that didn't even put a dent yeah. in that. You know, <laughs> not even a small dent. There you go, guys. I love talking to this guy, man. He's he's eat up with fishing as much as I am. Uh, he, he's eat up with the, uh, the the catfish population, the biology behind it, the science behind it, and he is working. He's a I say working. He's a part of this this panel they have. And the way that works is they've got people from all uh, stakeholders. They they've got crab fishermen. They've got biologists. They've got saltwater commercial fishermen up there. And Christian is one of the few catfish anglers that is on there that likes that old non-native invasive fish as it's described so i'll keep you posted again as, as I said in the podcast this is in its early stages this is just developing and uh there will be a lot that will happen here there will be a lot in this evolution so i uh, hope you enjoyed it until next time we'll catch you out on the water